1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. And uh, it's Elijah. And I love Elijah. He, he's like one of my favorite people in scripture. And I love it too because James tells us in the New Testament, James says, Elijah is a guy just like you and me. But when you look at the life of Elijah, you're like, yeah, but he's also Elijah. You know what I mean? Like he's like, did some crazy stuff. And so if you're, if you're new to the Bible or new to his story, I mean, he basically, God called him in a season when Israel was drifting bad away from God. And so, um, Ahab and his wife Jezebel, King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, they've introduced worship to Baal and slain the prophets of God and just about eliminated the worship of the one true God. And then Elijah comes on the scene with a warning for the people. And basically he says, Hey, you know, we're going to have a drought for three years. Basically, we're going to have a drought until I say so by, by, by way of God. And, uh, and then he does this thing where there's a showdown with the prophets of Baal. And so the one prophet of God, Elijah, standing against all these hundreds of prophets of Baal. And they're, they're on this mountainside. And he's, they have two different offerings. You know the story. But you've got, like, he set it up. He's like, hey, let's just set up a, a place for us to burn these offerings up. And you call fire down from heaven. And if your God does it, cool. I'll say, I'll say you got a real God. And then... And then I'll do it. And if my God does it, you know, and so he ends up like God strikes it, uh, lights his offering. And, um, and then in true old Testament fashion, all the prophets of Baal are slain. You know what I mean? So it's a kind of a wild passage, but th- this is in first Kings 17. This is during the drought and, um, Elijah is directed by God to go to this widow. And so I love this miracle because it's like a two for, it's a two for one miracle. And so anyway, uh, one through nine, uh, beginning with verse seven, let's go right here. First King 17. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him, came to Elijah, go to once at the, to Zarephath in the, in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. God's directing you even when you don't know it, even when you don't know it. I don't know if you've had that experience before where God sent you on assignment, all these different random things to kind of get you to the place that you are currently. But God's working to multiply his goodness and grace in your life, even when you're not aware of it. So the widow, he's working and directing the widow, even though she doesn't even know who Elijah is, that he's coming, that God's going to do a work in and through her. She has no idea what's going to take place. So, but I want to encourage you that all the time God is creating opportunities, creating encounters, opening up doors, even when you can't see it. As a matter of fact, that's the way he works. Okay. Um, sometimes it's obvious to the parties at play in these situations. And then a lot, more often than not, it's way more, way more subtle. And so, um, it made me think of a couple things. First of all, like when Brooke and I, the miracle that is my wife and my family came about because I was, uh, I went to NC state and, um, no one. I, I knew that would happen. Okay. So it's like, so mad, so mad. We choke every year. Anyway, so we went to NC State freshman year. Um, and I met my wife by way of calculus. Here's the way God works. So, um, went to state. My, my professor's name is Jesus Rodriguez. So, I mean, I can't make this junk up. Jesus made a way, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, we're, so we, so we're in the room. Come on. That's good. We're in the room and first class Brooks sitting. I don't even know where Brooks sitting, but I see a girl and I'm like, Hey, this girl looks good. So I'm trying to sit next to this girl. And he's like, next class, wherever you put your name, you're going to be assigned next to that person. So I signed my next name next to where she was sitting. She ended up on the other side of the room. Don't know her name. And then there's a wall here and Brooke was right here. Right. And so, um, God was like, this guy's a moron. I'm putting a wall and then your only option, like she's the only girl that you can borrow paper from or gum or whatever, you know, because I was that guy or whatever. And so it's very studious meter. She's got all of her books with her at any given time, you know, 4.20 GPA or whatever it was. And she's, so she's that girl. And, and anyway, so, um, fast forward, uh, I'm, we go to, we meet at tutoring and realize that we're sitting next, you know, we've already met one another kind of superficially. And then at tutoring, we have a conversation. She invites me to a tutoring session. She's trying to make a hundred on the exam. Your boy's trying to pass, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, she didn't really want me to come to the, she was just being nice. She was like, 
yeah, sure. If you want to come, you can come. And she, she goes back to her room. Roommate, she's like, hey, I got a guy coming in a little while. He's going to do this study thing with us. And roommate's like, is he hot? She was like, no, no, he's not hot. <laughs> True story. True story. So, anyway. I don't really have a good transition except God's good. I got her, y'all. Put your hands together for B. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> subtle. He's subtle. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm going to use calculus. You know, Michael's terrible at calculus. He needs some help. He's going to ask this girl because he's lazy. And, he, you know, he's like, all this is going to line up. So, anyway, he's subtle. But God can use He's using, He's doing all these things behind the scenes in your life and my life for the miraculous work that he's doing. Makes me think of this past summer with our daughter, um, Zoe, so for those of you that have been around for a while, um, we, we lost our daughter over the summer, Zoe Hope. Uh, she, went to, she went to heaven. And, but during all that, um, she headed into that season. We had friends that were in Charlotte, biblical counseling, and they had given us a box. They do this ministry where they support families who are grieving the loss of babies. And so they uh, they gave us a box and it had a little dress in it, had a bunch of information about who they are. And they said, you're up in Hickory. We're not serving that area currently. Why don't you take it up there? You could take it to hospitals, wherever. We weren't pregnant at the time. And then in the beginning of the year, we found out we were pregnant. Well, I had this box just in the back of my car, riding around in the back of my car. Never took it to a hospital, never took it anywhere. And then once we found out about Zoe's condition, trisomy 18, and once we found out that she had passed, Brooke and I had this, re- this revelation that that box was for us. And so there's all kinds of different things in that season that God did to encourage us, to hold us, to comfort us, to remind us that he was in control. And we ended up burying her in one of their dresses. So it's wild. Like, and, and it, I mean, we didn't even know. We didn't even know. So I just want to encourage you. Like, he's working behind the scenes in your life. Things you think are not on purpose. God's directing you even when you have no idea what's going on. Widow at Zarephath, she's got the same thing. A miracle in the works means I've got an awareness that God's moving behind the scenes, even when I don't realize it. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I love Job 34, 20. We know God is working behind the scenes. So I don't, I don't always know how. I just know that he is. <laughs> okay, That's the faith posture that we want to take. God's directing me even when I don't know it. And so... She has no, no idea. The widow has no idea Elijah's coming, and yet she's directed. She begins to pick up sticks, and that's where we pick up in verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. When he came, when Elijah came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And she's like, cool, I got water. That's great. Verse 11, and she was going to get it. He was going to go get some water. She's like, I can feel that need. And then, uh, and then he said, hey, bring me a piece of bread as well. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Faith is risky business. It's risky business. Um, It's risky for this woman because she has nothing to offer. She doesn't have any food. She only has the ingredients for what she needs. I'm going to unpack that more in a minute. But the woman basically was willing to bring water, no problem. But then he asked for bread, and we read later in the passage, she doesn't have anything at home. She's got a little bit of oil, got a little bit of flour. She's like... My game plan was to go home, make a fire, bake some bread, eat it with my kid. We were going to die. That was literally our game plan. We don't have anything. I can't make bread. But then the prophet comes and he says, hey, will you do me a favor? Make me some bread. God knows all that, right? And so he asks her of the one thing that she has to offer, and she has this moment where she has to decide to risk. And so I believe that in God's economy, we miss out on the abundant life he's planned for us if we focus on the fact that we don't have enough. So instead of being obedient to what we know he's called us to, right, right? We're so focused on resources or we're focused on our situation or we're focused on what we don't have, right? I want the most abundant life and faith experience and I'm only going to get there, right? I'm going to have to let go of some things. God's going to require, he's going to require me. He always has. Anytime Brooke and I in seasons of like, anytime God's added more to our plate, it's always because we were willing to let go of certain things. As hard as it was, we were like, we have no idea how this is going to work. And then he blesses us because of obedience. He blesses us. And then it's like, okay. And then here's the thing. As he gives you more to steward, this is parable of the talents. But as he gives you more to steward, it gets harder. Because now it's more. So it's like harder to let go of. It's like, oh, snap. Like I got to, you know, I got to trust him with that much more. But that's what faith looks like over and over again in the New Testament. 
So in order to experience the more, we've got to be willing to let go of something. It reminds me of the rich young ruler in Mark 10. Same exact scenario for a rich young ruler, uh, except he's very rich. Okay. So God comes up to Jesus, calls him good teacher. What must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says, why do you call me good? Do you know what the laws say? And then he starts to rattle off the laws. And the young ruler says, yeah, I keep all those laws. I, I do all that. And then Jesus says, great. Verse 21, Jesus looking at him, he loved him. I love that. He loved him. And he said, you like one thing, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And, and some people have made this a universal command. It's not. He's just speaking to the one thing the guy won't let go of. So Jesus speaks to the heart. And so disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Rich young ruler wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus said, great. You got this one thing in your life you were unwilling to let go of. And I want you to let go of it and trust me with it. And then he went away sad because he couldn't let go of it. So I just want to encourage you. There's some things in your life and my life that I'm, that I'm unwilling to place in his hand. It might not be money. It might be, it might be time. It might be us. It might be a marriage. It might be a relationship, uh, a dating relationship. It might be kids. It might be vocation. It might be geography. Some of you feel like God's calling you to do a new thing, start a new business, do whatever. Like it's only in the aftermath of putting it in his hand. Will he bless it? And so that's what God's asking the widow to do in this passage. That's what he's asking us to do. It's, it's risky business. You might have to give up everything in order to get the more that's waiting on you. That's the way it looks biblically. I mean, I don't have another precedent. There's just biblical precedent. That's it. And so if you want the abundant life that God wants for you, you got to hold all your assets lightly, everything that he's given you. And I would say including and especially things like money, because this is what Jesus speaks to probably more than anything, more than heaven and hell combined. He covers the topic of money because he knows it's such a large idol in our lives. And there's never been a more affluent society. And you've never been, you've never had more than you have currently. So just be mindful of it and be willing to go, okay, God, what do you want me to do with my resources? Not just in a Sunday context, because a lot of people will think, okay, cool. I'll tithe, I'll give. And, um, but then I'm, you know, I'm good. And then the Holy Spirit the whole time is speaking to you and is like, hey, I want you to bless that family. I want you to buy their groceries. Hey, I want you to pull over. I know your schedule is important, but I want you to pull over and help this person. Hey, I want you to mow their grass. Hey, I want you to give away your car. And you're like, what? That's insane. He's like, I want you to give away your car. Like, just, I'm telling you, if you'll let God work in and through you, just will, willingness to, to live in an open-handed way, it's, it's this idea that faith um, is, is risky. And so look at what the widow's response to Elijah's ask is in, in verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a jar, a little, little olive oil in a jug. All I have are the ingredients to make bread, right? So if you're taking notes, write this down. God's full provision comes assembly required. His full provision comes assembly required. Um, it's a reminder that God's provision can be hidden in plain sight. That sometimes in order to experience the miracle we've been talking about, we've got to see the provision could be in pieces. So I know people who, are ex who pray for like financial breakthrough. I need God to show up. I need financial breakthrough. And then God brings you a job. You know what I'm talking about? Like, or like a financial planner. You know what I mean? Like go to financial peace. You know? And so like there's different things that God's doing in your life. People are like, hey, you probably don't need all of that, you probably, you know, so that people will speak over your life. There's different opportunities that we have. Assembly required. God's provision comes in, in pieces. So, so many times we think of God's provision as something tangible. So like food, shelter, clothes, money. Um, but my experience is provision always comes in, in by way of relationship. Always. So, and the same's true for right here. She needs a thing. God sees that she needs a thing. He sends Elijah to go and fulfill that need. There's nothing in my life, everything in my life that's awesome happened by way of relationship. Happened because other people got involved. Parents and extended family, spouse, kids, friends, church family, all that, all the opportunities that God's given me has happened by way of relationship. And so God desires to take the everyday experiences of your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the ingredients, the unpleasant, the painful, the understandable, uh, the understandable, the mysterious, and he uses all of it to equip and fulfill to a, spe a specific purpose. The idea is that he uses everything. We talk, we talk in growth track about how 
your purpose is on the other side. Like it's pursuing, it's pursuing the things that you're passionate about, the things that God has gifted you in, the things that you've been affirmed in, your life experience. Many of you have a ton of life experience in specific areas that you can be a support to other people, have purpose on. And it's also um, things that are painful. Most often it's the areas of your life that brings the most amount of pain. That's really where he desires for you to leverage. He desires, for, he wants you to, he, he wants to redeem it. He wants to put purpose on it. Nothing is wasted in your life. Some of you think, man, I've got really, you know, terrible moments in my life. I've done dumb junk and I've sinned in this way. Redeem it. Let him redeem it. Like let him use it. Share your faith and your testimony, your story with people who are going through the same things and then watch God work in that moment. And so the idea is that all of the full prov- provision comes by way of pieces. God, what, what have you put in my hand? What do I have to steward? Even my story, your story is something to steward. It's something to steward. And so every single week you got an opportunity to share it. Second Peter one, three says this for his divine power has been bestowed on us. Everything necessary for life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So not only do we need to be mindful that God is working behind the scenes and creating opportunity for us to experience great through, but sometimes the provision, almost always provision comes in pieces, right? Assembly required. And then let's, let's look at what Elijah says to her. He says this in response to, um, she says, Hey, we don't have, I don't have bread. All I have is some oil and some flour. And I, I've got a game plan for that. Verse seven, verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Don't let fear keep you from missing the miracle that God wants to do in your life. Don't let fear keep you from the abundant life that he has for you. The enemy wants you to be full of fear so you don't have enough to be faithful. So many people, I hear this, I don't have time. I don't have, I'm not good at anything. I don't have resources I would give, but I don't have anything to give. Don't let fear keep you from all that God wants to do in your life because you're unwilling. You just think you don't have enough. You don't have enough to offer. And the reality is, is like, there's not been a greater lie. Take what's ever in your hand, put it in his and watch him work. Right? Second Timothy 1, 7, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and self-control. So if you feel like God's asking you to risk, if you feel like God's asking you to give up something, it's only so that you can experience something greater. Don't play it safe. All right? We've experienced the same thing in our life time and time again. And that's really what I desire for church family. People who are most passionate, people who are most generous in your life and my life are people who've experienced this. They realize that life isn't about the accumulation of things, but that they are a conduit and that God desires to use them. He desires to work in and through them. And the more you steward well and the more generous you are, the more he hands you to be a conduit and to bless people. And so verse 13, it says this, uh, Elijah says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and do as you've said. So go home. Take care of you and your son, light the fire, do all that kind of stuff. You can feed yourself. But then he says this, but first, I want you to make me a small loaf of bread. First, I want you to make me one. And then from what you have, bring it to me. And then, and then you can make something for you and your son after you bring it to me. She's like, I already told you, like, I only got enough for one. You know what I mean? And, but, but I think the thing God's trying to teach us, and what I want you to write down if you're taking notes, is to trust God with your first. Trust him with your first. First, make a small loaf of bread for me. Make one for me. And the idea is to give God first fruits in area, every area of your life, right? All areas. So Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the other things that we're stressed out about, anxious, over, fearful of, not having enough is like, I will take care of you. I will take care of you. I take care of birds. You know what I mean? You're fine. You're like in my image. I'm, I'll handle it. If you seek me and you seek my kingdom first, I'll handle all the other, other things that you're worried about. So um, our life can get so involved in seeking other things first that we miss out. We miss out on the abundant life that he has for us because we prioritize other things instead of his kingdom. And so there's a principle all throughout scripture, Old and New Testament. It's the principle it's the principle of the tithe, that we would give God our best and our first. And it's the place, finances, people squirm in church world whenever you talk about finances. And the reason why is because, uh, because it's such a big idol in our lives. It's a big idol in my life. I'll be straight up. I like, I like going on vacation. I like having nice things. Sometimes God will ask me to give up certain things so that I can be a blessing to other people. And it's hard. 
it's hard to be like, bro, I had plans for that. You know what I mean? Like, how, and so it's, it's a hard thing. And it's the reason why he covers it so much in scripture. But he leads us to this place of principle. In the Old Testament, it was a legal requirement. So in the Old Testament, the tithe is a legal requirement. In the New Testament, it's about the grace of giving. So the principle of the tithe and putting God first, I would say the order matters more than the amount, right? And so Romans 7, 4 says, you've died to the law, you're released from the law, now you serve in the spirit. Galatians 2 says that the law of Christ, Jesus came to become our new standard and the law of love fulfills the Old Testament commandments. That's the reason why when Paul's talking about money, you don't hear him talk so much about a numerical amount as you do just the grace and the generosity and the heart behind giving. Paul says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. This is the reason why we don't obligate you to put a 10 in the plate. We don't pass a plate. And I'm not, I'm not down on any church that does. I just would rather you give out of an act of worship than just because your neighbor gave and you feel weird about not putting anything in. It's hard. You know what I mean? I'd rather you just prayerfully go, God, what do you want me to give? And then do it. The thing that God, the Holy Spirit's asking you to do, just do what he's asking you to do. And so um, the idea is to make giving to the Lord our first move, not just in finances. People love to talk about money. I'm telling you every area of your life, every area. Some of you, if you gave time first, all the other things would fall in. So if you, if you just began your day in a way, prayerfully, in God's word, seeking a relationship with him, if you would, if you would do that before, before any time on yourself or anybody else, just give to God. And, uh, and so, and then he gives us over to the abundant life. The idea is that collectively what we can do as a body of believers is so much greater than what we can do in isolation. We're doing these Operation Christmas Child boxes. This is a tangible. So, um, you know, it costs people around $50, $60 to, to fill a shoe box. And there's a few shoe boxes left back here at the back, but we've given out 400 and some odd shoe boxes that people have done. And if we, if let's say we do 500, 500 shoe boxes, that's about $30,000 worth of toys that are sent uh, across the world. And, and we're going to Boone with ours, so they usually work in Africa, rural parts of Africa. Kid gets the box. Not only the box, kid gets the gospel message. It blows the kid's mind. Like, who in the heck? From across the world, people are just sending me stuff and telling me that God loves me, has a call for my life. But I don't have $30,000 to spend on toys for people's Christmas. And you probably don't. Maybe you do. Maybe you got it like that. But, but collectively, the thing that we can do is so much greater what we can do in isolation. And it's only because so many of us have decided, I'm going to trust God first with my finances. I'm going to trust God first with my time. We had people get up and they were here this morning at six o'clock in the morning, setting the table for all of us to experience what we experience because they trust God with their talents. And so again, think about what that means for you. And then, and then just do and be faithful to whatever God tells you to do. Verse 14, we're going to keep reading in the passage. And so here's what Elijah says. He promises to the woman. He says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord sends rain on the land. Verse 15, she went away, did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day. I think it, and this just hit me. Um, I think it's cool how God gave her the gift of Elijah who said, Hey, if you'll do this, here's what the results are going to be. So I'm telling you, okay, I'm telling you right now, if you'll trust God first with every area of your life, the results are he will bless all the areas of your life that you place him first in. He will. He just will. And then you have to, you and I have to have the trust and the faith to actually apply that. Every relationship, our time, our energy, our resources, our passions, all that. And the idea, and I want you to write this down. Uh, if you're taking notes, is that obedience opens the door to abundance. It opens the door to abundance. Verse 16 of that same passage, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. And I love it because it's not Elijah's word, it's the Lord's word. Elijah's just the mouthpiece. God told her, here's what I'm going to do if you'll do the thing I'm asking you to do. And again, you got to prayerfully just say, hey, what is that? What does that look like for me? But when I'm obedient, when I'm faithful, God blesses it. And so that's what Ephesians 3.20 reminds us. You and I have dreams and aspirations and goals in every area of our life. And God wants more for you in that area of your life than you want for yourself. So think about whatever you're mar- like. Some of you, you're like, I got, we got work to do on our marriage. Our marriage is not looking great. And you have kind of like an idealized version of what marriage should look like. God wants you to have a better one. 
His, his is better than whatever you have in your head. Some of you think about the relationship with your kids, the way you want that to look. His looks better. Some of you think about the vocation, what you're going to do with your time and your energy and your career. And you're like, I really want to do this. I'm telling you, whatever he has planned for you is so much greater than what you have planned. In the area of your finances, you have plans. He has better ones. And so abundance leads us, or obedience leads us to this place of abundance. And so, um, so she gets the miracle. The widow gets the miracle. But here's the crazy thing. If you keep reading in chapter 17, she gets this miracle. It's awesome. Oil never runs out. Flour never runs out. And then a little while later, verse 17, her son dies. And it's like, what? And uh, how many of us have ever gone through a hard thing, but you were you felt like, man, I was doing the thing. Like I was faithful, I was obedient. I was trying, we were doing all the things, you know? And, um, and metaphorically, like our son still died. And, and so I know, I and mean, we've been there, we've gone through hard stuff and it's like, man, God, I'm being faithful, I don't understand. So many of us tie, um, you know, we have kind of like a retributive justice idea of the way that the world works, the way God works. It's like, if I do good things, good things will happen. If I do bad things, bad things will happen. I'm going to tell you, if you're faithful and you're obedient, you'll experience God. He'll give you over to an abundant life. It's not a prosperity gospel. It's not that you're going to be rich. You may be. He may bless you in that way. I'm not saying he won't. I'm just saying that's not the end game. Like, you're faithful, you're obedient, and what's going to happen is you're going to have fulfillment and purpose and joy, and you're going to come alive in a way that you never could if you weren't obedient. Because here's the thing. We stand on the shoulders of church leaders and apostles and first, first century church leaders who laid down their lives, not metaphorically, literally for the sake of the gospel. And, and if, they had it over to, if they had it all to do it over again, they would do it again. Because they realize, hey, this gospel is insane. This is worth my life. Also, it's true. Like I've seen and experienced the resurrected Christ. It's the only card I have to play. People were, you know, people, the early church was persecuted. And people was like, if you would renounce Jesus, if you would abdicate your faith, if you, you know, if you would just not say that you're a Christ follower and a Jesus follower, they're like, no, I can't. Because it's true. And I literally understand what the implications are eternally. If I have, like, I know it's true. And I'm going all in and I'm placing my future hope and salvation on Jesus. And my life is going to align with it. And then he's calling us to do the same thing. In every area of our life, trust him. Like, God, help me to be obedient so that you can get me over to a place of fulfillment and joy and coming alive in you. That regardless of what's going on around me in my world, I have a peace that just marks my life. I have a confidence in you. I have a joy in my future and a hope and a salvation to hope for because of what you're doing. And so son gets sick, he dies. And then a uh, widow comes to Elijah and she's like, what the heck, right? So this is what happens. Verse 17, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Which so many of us have that kind of mindset. But he said, hey, give me your son. And he took, her from, he took him from her arms and he carried her to the upper room where he was staying and he laid him on the bed and then he cried out to God, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow that I'm staying with by causing her son to die? And so even Elijah's kind of questioning this moment. And he's even doubting in this moment. What is happening? But he begins, he begins to pray. He stretches his body out. So he stretched himself out on the boy and three times he cried out to the Lord. He begins to intercede on behalf of the child and he's like, God, just take whatever... Whatever you need from me, God, just get, you know, and he just begins to pray for him, calls out to him, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Let it return to him. And then verse 22, the Lord heard Elijah's cry. The boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son's alive. I love it. So not only does she get to experience the provision of God, but the widow gets to experience resurrection. And I think the thing that God wants to teach us over and over again is that when there's a willing... So, first of all, God knew all this was going to happen. None of it caught God off guard. Like, he knew that the boy was going to die. He knew that Elijah was going to need to resurrect him. He knew that they were running out of oil. He knew that they were running out of flour. Whatever it is that you're facing, God knows where you're at and what you need. 
and he'll meet you. If you're paying attention, he'll meet you and he'll ask you to risk something. He'll ask you to offer something so that you can experience more of him. I believe that her faithfulness brought about the second miracle of resurrection. Her son wasn't sick because of Elijah being there. Her son was saved because she welcomed Elijah in and fed him. And as a result, God did a miracle. God did a miracle. Oil never ran out. Flour never ran out. But here's the other miracle. She got to experience resurrection. And so many times this passage is preached and this is kind of the resurrection is just like on the side. All of it was about resurrection, by the way. None of it was about oil. None of it was about flour. All of it was about the dead kid coming alive. And every New Testament miracle, every miracle in scripture is about that same thing. Jesus didn't heal people with leprosy, the blind, the lame, the mute, the deaf. Jesus didn't heal people who were hurt. Like He healed people ultimately so they could experience him and come alive in him. So they could experience resurrection. Every single one of them, all of them, every single person who had ever been healed, Old Testament and New, died. But notice what Jesus says over and over again when he heals people and the miraculous happens. Hey, your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. And he always leads with the spiritual. He always says, hey, because of your faith, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do a thing in your life. But also, you just, you can see now. You can see me. And that's my prayer for us as a church. Man, let's steward things. Let's live life open-handed. God say, hey, I know sometimes I make excuses. I say, I think I don't have enough. But I know you're asking me in relationships and in time spent and, and in passions and in serving and in giving and all the areas. God, I know you're asking me to risk something so that I can experience something greater. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your life. Thank you so much that you came on a rescue mission for all of us. And God, to show us that our worth is in you and our value is in you. Our purpose is in you. And you are the point. You're it. So I pray you lift the head of every sinner in this room, including myself, to remind you of how much is awaiting the other side of faithfulness, the other side of obedience, the other side of doing the things that we know that you're asking us to do. You desire to bless us. You desire to, to help us experience resurrection. And so if you're here today and you've spent a lifetime in church, you've kind of gone through religious motion um, and you've heard about Jesus and you know something about him, but you, you don't know him. You don't have a personal relationship with him. Scales have never fallen off. You've never really seen him for who he is. Salvation is the moment you realize who he is in, in, uh, in comparison to who you are. I'm a sinner in, in need of a savior. I'm broken in need of being made whole. God, I'm, I cannot save myself. You have to. And so if you're here today and that's you and your experience, you're experiencing that. It's a Holy Spirit moment. It's a God moment where you finally see Jesus for who he is. If you, have, if you place your faith and your trust in him, your future in him, and you decide to turn from the life you live in, which has been about you, and make it about him and make it about others, serving others. Man, that's a saving faith. The Bible tells us this, that your faith, just by way of the grace of God, that saves you. But I, I want you to seal it, and I want you to mark it. Confess it, really, with a prayer this morning. So if that's you, and you want to come alive in Christ, would you do me a favor? Just raise your hand in this room this morning and say, hey, that's me. I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to know him today. Is there one person in here, you're like, that's me. I want to know him. I want to come alive in Jesus. See a hand. That's awesome. Is there anybody else? Yeah, if that's you, just pray this prayer. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. It's the only thing that makes sense in response to what I'm experiencing today. I give you my life. Thank you for your life, your death, and your resurrection. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your faithfulness. And by way of your faithfulness, I get to experience eternity. So today I make you Savior, but also make you Lord. Help me to put you first in every area. God, help me to, to do really what all these families are doing today. Dedicate my life, my family, my future, my children, everything that I have. God, let me, let me return what's really yours and watch you bless it by way of return. And so establish my steps, open up doors, work behind the scenes, do things that I never could do on my own and give me over to an abundant life. Fulfillment, joy in you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.